Hello, welcome back. Well, what do you do if you want to say something really, really important to somebody and you really want them to listen to what you're saying? Well, let's see what God did. Well, do you remember we had all the people of Israel camped around Mount Sinai and Moses had gone up to talk to God and God had provided the earthquake and the trumpet sound and the thick cloud and the thunder and lightning so the people of Israel would know that it is him that was speaking to Moses. He was giving Moses the words. It wasn't just Moses' words, these were God's words. And so the Bible tells us now, God spoke all these words. And the first thing he says is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Well, that's true, isn't it? That's exactly what had happened. And he's reminding the Israelites that he is that powerful God who brought them up out of Egypt, brought them out of slavery as they'd asked him to. Now, if you've got something that somebody needs to say to you, you say the important thing first, the really, really important thing, don't you? And God's the same. He's going to tell them the very, very most important thing first. And it is this. You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before God himself. God wanted his people to know that he was the only true, real, living God. And that they weren't to worship or love or follow any other God, anything else that they thought was a God. Because he was the only God who was real. And I think he tried to show them that, didn't he, on that mountain? Can you think of ways he's tried to show that to you? We're going to have a think about lots of different things that are important. So let's have a look. Well, school. School's quite important, isn't it? Books, reading books for pleasure or um, just because it's a good story or school books or your pets. Your pets are very important. It's important to look after them, isn't it? Friends. Yes, friends are important, definitely. How about toys? Well, they can be quite important to you, can't they? Especially that special toy that you can take to bed or play with a lot or you really, really enjoy. Oh, this one's a good one. Family. Your mum and dad and brothers and sisters and cousins and aunties and uncles and grandma and grandpa, they are all incredibly important, aren't they? Of course they are. Um, how about films? Yes, we like watching films sometimes, don't we, to enjoy uh, hobbies and crafts, things like doing puzzles or knitting or uh, train spotting and all sorts of different things we can do for hobbies, can't we, and learning about things. How about television? Yes, we like, enjoy watching television, don't we? Oh, and I bet a lot of you, it's computer games. Yes, we do enjoy the computer, don't we? And to us, in our lives, it could be quite important. Well, this one, here we go. What would you fill in here? There's a blank one there, for maybe something I haven't thought about. All of these things are important. Of course they are. But what is the most important thing? Who is the most important thing? Do you know what? It's God. And he wants to be the most important out of all of these things. He's the one who's real, who answers our prayers. He's the one who loves us so much. Well, our family love us too, don't they? But God is the one who can do miracles. God is the one who is the real God. None of these things are God. They are good, but none of these other things are God, are they? And God wants to be number one. 
He is the only true, real God. Now, the Old Testament has a very interesting story. Now, God had asked the people of Israel to make an Ark of the Covenant, and I'll tell you a little bit about that soon. And it represented his presence amongst the people of Israel. And one time, there was a big battle between the Israelites and the Philistines. And the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, and they took it off in triumph, and they put it in the temple of their God. Dagon. Now, the real, true, living God wasn't going to be put up with being put in a temple with a, a God that was just a statue. And he dealt with that quite, in quite a funny way, actually, which we'll see soon. And it does show that we have a real, true, living God, as opposed to a God who's just a statue and not real at all. Israelites fought many battles against the Philistines. One day, the Philistines defeated Israel. The leaders of Israel said, why did God let us lose to the Philistines? The Israelites decided to take the Ark of the Covenant, a wooden box covered in gold that reminded them that God was with them, and carry it to the battlefield. Maybe the Ark would help them win. Eli's sons, the priests, took the Ark of the Covenant to the Israelites' camp. When the army of Israelites saw the Ark, they shouted with joy. Surely they would win the battle now. The Philistines came out to fight against the Israelites, and the Philistines won again. They killed thousands of Israelites, including Eli's sons, and they even captured the Ark of God. One of the men in the battle ran to tell Eli what had happened. When Eli heard the news, he fell backward in his chair, broke his neck, and died. The Philistines took the Ark of God to a temple where they worshipped a false god named Dagon. They put the Ark next to the statue of Dagon. The next morning, the Philistines entered the temple and saw that Dagon's statue was face down in front of the ark. They set the statue back up where it belonged. The next day, the statue was face down again. This time, its head and hands were broken off. God punished the people living in the city where the Philistines kept the ark. The people got sick and they wanted to get rid of the ark. When they moved the ark to another city, everyone in that city got sick. So they moved the ark to a third city, then everyone in that city got sick too. The Philistines were afraid. They didn't want God to punish them anymore. So they decided to return the ark along with gifts of gold to show they were sorry for taking it. They hitched two cows to a cart and put the ark on the cart. The cows moved the ark down the road until the ark of God was back with the Israelites where it belonged. The ark of God reminded the Israelites that God was with them. Years later, God gave his people something greater than a sign that he was with them. God gave them his son, Jesus, God in the flesh. One of Jesus' names is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay, well, did you see in that story something that looked a bit like this? And this was called the Ark of the Covenant. And what it was was a wooden box, literally made of wood, but they covered it all inside and out with gold. And then there were these poles put through either side. 
and they stayed there permanently. And then there was a lid, or called the mercy seat, on the top, also made of gold. And two, can you see these wings? Two cherubim on top. And they were sort of like angels. And their wings met in the middle. And it was here on the mercy seat, in between the wings of the angels, that God's presence was especially meant to be. And it was. And this whole Ark of the Covenant was put inside the temple, the tabernacle, tent of meeting in the Holy of Holies, and that is where Moses and later on some of the other priests used to go and meet with God. This was after the mountain. Okay, so it's, the story is later than our, than what we're talking about, with Moses on the mountain, so this is a bit later on. Anyway, this Ark of the Covenant was supposed to represent God's presence amongst his people. So, when they were battling the Philistines, now the Philistines had defeated them once, and the people of Israel were starting to cry out to God and saying, why have we been defeated? I know what. Let's get the Ark of the Covenant in. Now, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't a good luck charm. It wasn't something, it wasn't magic in any way or anything like that. Although, sort of, the people sort of, used him a little bit like that, didn't they? Um, thinking, oh, well, if God's presence is there, then we can't lose. But that's not the way God works, is it? And the people hadn't really repented and humbled themselves and, and, and turned to God to go God's way. They were just bringing the Ark of the Covenant in. Anyway, I think God wanted to teach them a lesson. And he also wanted to teach the Philistines a bit of a lesson too. Because when the Philistines defeated the Israelites, they captured the Ark of the Covenant. And they took it off in triumph to their city. And there, remember, they put it in their temple along with their god, Dagon, which is a statue of their god. Now, the Philistines didn't they, to them, these were just two bits of something representing gods. So this was their god and this was the Israelites' god. And to them, they were both the same. However, we know one of those gods was real and one of them was just a statue. Which one do you think it is? Yes, that's right. This, although it is just a wooden box represents the real, true, living God. Okay? And this, again, is a statue, but it represented a God that wasn't real at all. It wasn't a true God. It was a made-up God. Now, overnight, so they put it in the temple and off the Philistines went. But because our God is the real, true God, he wasn't going to stand for this, was he? He was going to deal with this false god. But he did. First night, he took it off its pedestal and made it just fall on the ground. Okay, and when the Philistines came back in, they thought this was strange, but perhaps somebody did that, and so they put it back up again. And of course, the temple was shut up, and they all went out. What happened the second night? Well... It was off his pedestal again, and this time the head and the hands, specifically just those things, had fallen off. And actually, the Bible says they were laid on the threshold of the temple. And I think our God was trying to say, look, I'm the real God. And then after, shortly after that, the people started to get sick and they moved the cow the Ark of the Covenant to different towns, didn't they? And they got sick too. And in the end, the Philistines realised that while they had the Ark of the Covenant, they weren't going to prosper. They had to give it back to the people of Israel. And it was God's presence, and he dwelt amongst his people, Israel. 
Now it's interesting actually because what they did, they put in gold and they put in um, some statues of the, the illnesses. But the, what they did, they got two cows that had just had calves. Now I don't know if you know this, but when you've got a cow that had a calf, it doesn't want to leave its side. And they shut up the calves and they put the cows on the, on the cart to set it off. Now, normally, these cows wouldn't have gone and they'd have gone all over the place and they wouldn't have pulled it and they would have stopped. And they would, would have stayed with their calves. But you know what? God had his hand on them and he caused them to go straight and true back to Israel. And it was a sign to the Philistines again that this wouldn't normally happen, but it was a sign to the, the Philistines that God was in control and he was the one guiding and directing these, these cows to go back to Israel and take the presence of God back. And that's what happened. The, whole, the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence went back to his people. And he showed, didn't he, that he was the real God. And here's our memory verse for this week, which is the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 20 verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 20 verse 3. And here they are, the priests of Israel carrying the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. Now the reason they did that, because they had the poles there, is of course God's presence dwells in people. God himself lives in our hearts. And this was a picture of that. But we are to have no other gods before him, God himself. He's the one true God, isn't he? And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Now we're going to see a video about putting some rocks and some rice in a container, which you might think is a bit strange, but I want you to have a think about what you think the rocks and the rice might represent in life. Okay, and let's see which fits in best.
Okay, what did you think about the rocks and the mice? Well, obviously the rocks fitted in best when you put them in the container first and then you fitted in the rice around it. And the rocks really were the big things that are in, in life, the important things in life. And the rice were the things that weren't so important, but they could just fit in around it. And I think that shows us that God is to be the number one importance in our lives. And then everything else follows on. But if we put everything else in our lives first and just think God's an add-on, we'll suddenly find that we don't have room for him after all. So we need to make sure God is number one. You shall have no other gods before me. And that's our memory verse, isn't it? The first commandment. today's craft well it's not a craft it's a challenge actually and yes that's an empty tray and I want you to go around the house and collect about 10 totally different items and pop them all together onto a tray and then we're going to do a bit of a challenge or a quiz okay well these are the things I found around the house for my tray it's about 10 totally different things. I wonder what you found for yours. Now I'm going to do a little quiz and you can see if you can either test yourself or you can test somebody else in the house. And here's some questions. Okay, first one. What's the most expensive thing on your tray? Hmm. Well, on my tray, uh, I don't know, the hand gel maybe or the book? Oh, I know. Possibly this. Torch. Oh, that was bright, wasn't it? Okay. The softest thing. Hmm. What's the softest thing on your tray? I think the banana's pretty soft. What about it? Oh, yeah, they look very squidgy in toilet roll. I think that's the softest thing. The largest thing. Oh, I think that's pretty easy as well. Definitely toilet roll. What about on yours? Is the softest thing and the largest thing the same? Or the heaviest thing? Okay, let's have a think. Book's pretty heavy. Banana. Oh, I think it's the hand gel. Definitely. What's next? The lightest thing. Hmm. Okay. 
scissors, maybe, or the peg. Peg's pretty light, actually. Or the spoon. No, I think it's the pencil. What about on your tray? Then the most useful thing. Hmm. Well, that's quite a difficult question, isn't it? Because everything on there is useful in its own way and depends on what your need is. For example, if you were hungry, you wouldn't start eating this, would you? You'd eat the banana. Yeah, that would be the most useful thing. Or if you had to go out in the dark, what would be the most useful thing? Yes, the torch. Or if your hands were dirty, gel. Or if you had to cut some scissors, it would be the scissors, wouldn't it? Cut with scissors, I meant. Or if you wanted to read a book. Or if you wanted to be the book or eat a yogurt, well, you wouldn't eat a yogurt with a pig, would you? You'd need a spoon or write something. You'd need a pencil. So all of these things are useful, but it does depend on what you need at the time. So that was an interesting question, wasn't it? What's the next one? What's the most important thing? Hmm. The most important thing. Wow. What do you think, children? Hmm. Well, the most important thing. Well, they're all important, aren't they? But look, the most important thing is going to be something that's number one. And you remember we talked about lots of different things in your lives that were important and useful and definitely part of your life, very definitely. But we talked about, yes, that's right. He wasn't on my tray, was he? But here we are, God, and he needs to be number one. The number one love in our life, the number one in all that we do and say. Because do you remember? You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 20 verse 3. And what it means is we don't put other things in God's place. We, we honour and worship him. He is the most important thing of all.